the U.S. are you coming to us from? I am coming to you from Palmdale, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles, about 45 miles north of Los Angeles. And are you originally from California? No, I'm actually originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm from the East Coast, and I lived in New York for 18 years before I moved to Los Angeles. You have one of my favorite coming to quilting stories. Can you share that with everyone? When I lived in New York, I was an actress. I was a Broadway actress, and I used to do theater and shows in New York City all over, and I was cast in a show called The Quilters which is a musical play. And it takes place in the 1800. It's about pioneering women, frontiering, you know, the West. And I was cast to play one of the roles. And of course I had to look convincing making quilts because as the characters we had to quilt and be doing things and talk as if, you know, we were really comfortable with it. So they brought in like a uh, this lovely woman from one of the local quilt guilds to teach us how to hold a hoop for on stage. But of course, I took it to the next level. I fell in love with quilting during that show. I kept quilting even after the curtain went down behind, you know, backstage, in between shows. I went to the costume shop and got scraps and I was making a quilt. And then by the end of the run, I had made my first handmade and hand pieced and hand quilted wall hanging. It was like a log cabin quilt. I was bit by the quilting bug. And from then on, I did not look back. And that was about 21 years ago. Were any other family members quilters? Well, here's the, here's the unique thing. When I decided I was going to quilt and it was going to be a part of my life, because once the show ended, I was like, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know what's going on. This is something that I have to do. I'm, I'm not leaving this behind. So I bought a sewing machine. It was a Sears Kenmore, <laughs> like $175 machine. And so I called my mother and I said, mom, you're not going to believe this. I am quilting now. And on the other end of the phone, I, I like heard like some sniffling and, and, and I, I was like, is my mom crying? And I was like, mom, I was like, are you okay? And she was like, your grandmother was a quilter. She was one of the most beautiful quilters and her quilts were lost in a fire. So we don't have any of her quilts and it broke her heart. She didn't quilt after that. And so she never taught me how to quilt. So your, that is your grandmother in you passing down quilting to you. That's just heartbreaking that all of them were lost, but lovely that you inherited that from your grandmother. As I like to say, I was taught spiritually how to quilt <laughs> from my grandmother. <laughs> But it skipped your mom. Your mom wasn't a quilter. No, my mother wasn't a quilter. My mother used to make our clothes <laughs> when I was younger. So she used to make like little corduroy jumpsuits and things like that. So she taught me how to cut out patterns and I would always thread her needle and I knew how to do a straight stitch on the sewing machine. But quilting, that was no, she did not teach me. She did not know how to quilt. As a matter of fact, I teach her how to quilt. So tell me about this beautiful quilt behind you. It is just spectacular. This is um, a quilt that I made and I call it Midnight in Nigeria. It's a really simple pattern, but the way that it's arranged, it looks more difficult than it is, but any um, quilter will know that these are half square triangles arranged in a windmill pattern and then there's like a little secondary pattern um, you see where the white ones are but I used all African wax fabrics for the print along with the solid purple is just a solid quilting cotton and the like little squares the African print squares for the 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 first border and then another African print for the borders and the bindings 
and African prints are something textiles that I just absolutely love working with. I love them for the bold colors and the prints. And they're really sometimes challenging to work with for quilters, but I see that as exciting. And so, yeah, this is just a really kind of traditional pattern made with African wax print fabrics. I started going down a the rabbit hole of African prints last year. And I was surprised, one, of the history of them, and two, it's just not one fabric. It's it's many different styles, and some of them are attached to colonialism. What we think of an African fabric is actually an English fabric that was sold to Africa. And then there's the traditional ones that are deeply embedded within the culture. Did you come to African fabrics right at the very beginning of your quilting journey, or did that come in later? Yeah, so actually, thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. The people are very surprised to learn about the history of African wax fabrics. They're not necessarily the indigenous um, African fabrics, but they have like the prints, many of them hold the meanings of indigenous fabric. And they were actually brought to Africa by the Dutch who were looking to improve upon how the Indonesians made their batiks. So it's a really wonderful history, but um, yeah. And so that's why some people are afraid to use them because they're like, are we allowed to use them? Because, you know, culturally is that appropriation, but they're not indigenous. <laughs> they are of the, the culture and, um, but anybody can use them. And actually people love to see their fabrics all over the world. So how I came to African fabrics was actually as a child. My mother was, um, I grew up, ooh, I'm dating myself, Karen, but I'm a child in the seventies. <laughs> and my mom at the time in the seventies was very much, you know, black pride. We were coming into that whole era and it was exciting. And, you know, we were moving away from the Eurocentric looks of like straight hair and linear complex. And we were embracing our, you know, um, African heritage. And so my my mother, she was in African dance class. So I used to, she dragged me to African dance class. And so that's how I started dancing before I even was formally trained in ballet and things like that. And so they were just draped and adorned in beautiful fabric. Like they, they were wraps and they were on their head and around their waist. And then also in regular clothing, my mom was wearing daishikis and we would have like mud cloth around the house. So it was something that I grew up around because, you know, it was just a time of affirming and our identities, you know, as a culture and as a race, but in quilting, yeah, actually, it was kind of pretty early on as a quilter because I lived in Harlem when I lived in New York. And along, if anyone's ever been to Harlem, especially like in the 90s, there were tons of African markets all along 125th Street. I think they've moved the markets like off the street. They're like kind of tucked away back, but they're still sh boutiques and they're fabric, fabric, fabric for days. So I started by buying mud cloth and mud cloth is a heavier, a, th a really thickly woven indigenous fabric. So it's not necessarily the easiest to work with for piecing work, but it's beautiful. Like you can use it for art quilts. Um, you may see them like in apparel or furniture or crafts or wall hangings, things like that. But for piecework, it, it's a little bit tricky. Um, so I started making like wall hangings, just kind of cutting big pieces of mud cloth and table runners and things like that. And then I found out that the African wax prints were actually 100% cotton. And so then I was like, oh, well, I can do that with piecework. And so I started experimenting. Oh my gosh. And that's when my world opened once I learned that I could use the wax prints or Ankaras, as they're frequently referred to as well. Ankaras, African wax prints, 
African batiks, they're all kind of synonymously called the same thing. I, I started using them in quilts very early on. Some of them have really big patterns. And I think that's also one thing that scares people is that, okay, so this is not a symmetrical repeating print. It's a little bit imperfect. How do we incorporate those into our blocks? But I'm looking at the pieces that you've got behind you. And just, as you say, those bold colors. I, I love bold colors. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that we need to do to these fabrics before we use them? Like, do we have to pre-wash them? Do we have to treat them um, for color fastness or are they just good to go? They're just like any other cotton. They're batiks, the way they're, they're high quality cotton in the way they are dyed. Um, so they're just like batiks. So you, you can, if you want to, pre-wash them, but you don't have to. They don't, they won't bleed. I just wash them in cold water with mild soap with no like bleach. And then I tumble dry them on a very light or cool-ish dryer cycle. And then right before it dries, I just take it out and let it air dry the rest of the way. Um, or you can hang dry it, you can hand wash it, hang dry it, you know, so pretty much the same care for your regular um, quilting cottons. And yeah, you can starch them, you can iron them, they iron really well. One of the reasons I don't like to pre-wash them is one, because there is going to be some shrinkage, you lose some yardage, like any other because they're 100% cotton and then they actually really piece well together when they're when 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 the fabric is new it's like i like the stiffness um of the fabric before you wash it and i just want to get going you know i don't want to wash and starch and iron like i'm ready to go out of the gate so the time is a factor and also i definitely would not recommend pre-washing them if you buy pre-cuts. So jelly rolls and layer cakes and charm cakes, which you can buy these fabrics in, I wouldn't pre-wash. So if you are squeamish about it, buy the yardage and then cut, cut everything yourself. Now we're calling them African, but Africa is a, is a continent with all sorts of wonderful, diverse groups of people in it. Is there something different between, or have you noticed that regionality of Nigerian fabrics from Ghanan fabrics from Boswanian? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because they come from all over Africa. And one of the beautiful things about these fabrics is the prints and the designs even though the fabrics, you know, they're, they're owned by the Dutch or English mills or whatever, the designs on them are very specific. So a lot of the designs and the meanings and the symbols on them, you can tell where they are native to based on those designs. So if they have really graphic designs or maybe they're floral or maybe they're repeats or they're like dots or they're symbols. That's going to mean either like they could be from Nigeria or they could be from Ghana. They could be um, from, you know, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, Egypt. You know, they can be from all over. And then, you know, the indigenous ones are going to be more named more specific to the regions that they're actually from. Now, you are a lively, spirited extrovert. I mean, I, I only know you for a couple of minutes here, and that is very, very obvious. But quilting is a slow, solitary, sedentary process. How do you balance your energy? Oh, that is a great question. And I love you for asking that. You know, we all have two sides, right? I'm a Libra, and so balance is very important to me. So in one respect, yes, I'm very outgoing and, you know, extroverted and, you know, personality, but the other artistic side of me is what you explained. It's very, you know, spiritual. 
it is very quiet and um, reflective and meditative um, for me. So I'm in a different mode and I'm kind of like in a different headspace when I am quilting. Although I think that part of me is what I infuse into my quilting. Cause as you see the colors <laughs> that I choose, that is the essence of my personality. But in the practicing of it is where the spiritual process, the connection, the quiet, um, the creative is showing itself. So I love it because I can go in my room and I can be quiet. I can have music on. I can have a podcast or a book playing, or I can be in my studio for hours with nothing on at all, no background noise. And it doesn't matter because I'm just here. So yeah, that's the balance. That's the other side. That's the other me when I'm quilting. Have your colors changed in the last, well, when did you say you started? 20 years ago? Yeah. So were you making these big, bold, beautiful quilts at the very beginning or has your palette changed? You would think it would change after all these years. I venture out um, just to push myself out of my comfort zone, but I always land back on these big, bold colors. I'm working on a quilt now that is in a neutral color pilot. I didn't mention this earlier, but I love Indonesian batiks are my other jam. So I love African fabrics and I love Indonesian batiks. And so I'm working on a batik quilt now that is in a neutral, it's like creams, browns, blacks, and grays. And initially I was like, how am I going to connect to this? Like, how am I going to make this something that I'm excited about and follow through if that, because color gives us energy, right? If I don't have that energy, if I'm not, I'm, I'm looking at this every day and it's not giving me anything back. I'm just not going to be motivated. But I was so surprised. I love that quilt. And I've loved working in a whole nother color pilot. And so I'll do that. It's almost like a cleaning of my, no pun intended, soft pilot. <laughs> you know, when you eat something and you have some mint to clean it to get another flavor. Going out of my color comfort zone is nice and refreshing because I feel like I come back and I approach what I love in a new, like fresher way of seeing things. So I might venture out, but I always come back to it. <laughs> now, was there something going on in your life that allowed those colors to calm you or settle you? It was a commission that someone um, that was their color pilot. And I, and like I said, I love a challenge. I, I, I love trying new things. I love exploring. I love discovering things that I didn't know that I liked or could do. I do something. I'm like, oh, this is the first time I'm trying this. I do that a lot. Even though I love this color pilot, I'm always trying something new. So I embraced trying that, even though it wasn't like my go-to. So even without the commission, there are times where I say, you know what? I'm, I, I need, I need a, I need to clean my, my thing. So I'm going to do another color and, and just kind of recalibrate. Isn't that the fabulous thing about quilting is that you're constantly doing something new. You can do what you've done before, but there's always so much delight to come. You think you've done it all, or I've done this before, but you've you're doing it slightly different and, and it affects you differently. Yeah, it really does. It's exciting. And also new ways of doing things, right? It's fun yeah. to learn. You know, I do applique, raw edge applique is something, one of my specialties. And I had one way I was kind of doing it for a long time. And then a year ago, I think a year ago, I was like, let me try something else. And it's hard because we spend so much money on the tools and the materials that we know work. <laughs> so when someone introduces, it, it's like, oh, that means I have to like buy this and this and this, but I did it. And so it's just kind of expanding your repertoire 
And so that's how I look at it. And it's, it's, it's good. It's good. It's not cheap, but <laughs> it makes us more flexible. You are now a teacher. Have you passed on your love of quilting to any of your students? So I teach high school students uh, film and TV production. But in my capacity at my job, I also um, work in the field of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And so we do programming and things like that um, at my school. So we had um, a diversity day a couple months ago, and we just did a day of workshops for kids where kids could pick what they wanted to do. So one of the, and the teachers could lead a workshop. I was going to teach African dance, but then I heard my colleague who is actually one of the dance teachers at the school where I teach, she was going to teach Hawaiian. And I said, well, maybe I could teach like a quilting class. And then my boss was like, yes, that I was like, really? <laughs> you think that, um, the kids, it's kind of like an old people thing. You think they would enjoy it. And this was actually eighth graders. I said, okay, well, I'll teach them about the history of quilts in African-American culture and about story quilts and also the legend of the Underground Railroad quilts. And then I'll have us make blocks for a portrait quilt so we can make it like a cultural identity appreciation day, but we'll use all African fabric for their clothing, but they can design their appliques. I created these templates of like, kids like nine different kids and they could they can choose the color of the skin like the fabric so I had like five different tones from like brown to peach <laughs> where they can choose for the skin and hair like they can choose black brown red and yellow for like blonde red and then prints and the kids ate it alive they loved it Karen they did so good like I wanted to cry they made beautiful blocks so I got a chance to piece the blocks together to make like you know a quilt and then I'm giving it to the school where they can like hang it or auction it off for the diversity fund or whatever they want to do to it but the kids really enjoyed it and during that time, some of the high school art students were hanging out and they were like, oh my God, Miss Dorsey, I didn't know you did these. Oh my gosh, can you tell me more about why don't we have a quilting club at school? So there was interest. And so I said, you know what? I'll think about that for next year. And so maybe I did, we'll see. Excellent, I love to hear it. So what is your favorite quilt? If there was a fire, God, I hate to say that now that I know that your grandmother's oh, all your grandmother's still so lost. Okay, um, I know where you're going. It's hard. <laughs> if you had to grab one, you only had the chance to grab one, which one would it be? Oh boy. Because you know whatever quilts I'm working on at the time is my favorite. Yes. So then when it's all said and done, it's probably my quilt called Black Butterfly. So it's an a raw edge applique quilt that is made with Indonesian batiks. And it's based um, on a beautiful artist. I, I saw the, it's, a, it's an art that she did and I took it and I made it into a quilt in fiber form. It has a yellow background and the wings are collaged with all these different batik colors. It is so beautiful. To, is that weird that I'm saying it's beautiful? I made it. Okay. It's beautiful to me. <laughs> it's beautiful to me. And it just gives me, I, I just love it. And I enjoy quilting it. I quilted it on my domestic machine. I love the whole process from beginning. So I would probably grab that one. And then the other one is also an applique quilt. I call that Midnight Dancer. And it's another batik applique quilt. And it's just magical. It has like these vine applique pieces that I put on it. And the main center is like a woman standing. And she's just kind of like the way that she's positioned. It has so much movement in it. And it's powerful and it's strong and it's myst mystique. 
And then the other quilt would probably be my self portrait applique cake quilt that I made because that was just a special sort of that thing we were talking about earlier that introspective sort of process there was a reflection and a um, thing going through I don't know if, it, if you've ever made a self-portrait not yet it's really interesting when you see yourself and you're you're picking colors and you're you pick the picture that you want and you're reflecting back on how you felt when you took the picture, what was going on in your life, where you are now, how you view yourself like internally as well. When I first started my business, I didn't know what I was going to do, what I was going to teach. That quilt is the, the quilt that I used to launch my first online quilt class. And it's just really special to me because when I was making it, I was just trying to, you know, I have been doing a lot of portrait quilts, but it was first time I'd done a self-portrait quilt. So I, it just holds special, like personal meaning. So if I had time, I would grab those three, but Lord, I would be busting my behind to grab a whole lot more. <laughs> Have you done a lot of traveling for quilting? I've done a lot of traveling when I, in my previous life, when I used to act, I toured the country for years and years. And then during that time, I was collecting fabric, unbeknownst <laughs> to me, that I was going to be using it years and years later. But 20 years, you know, when I was traveling, I used to go to quilt shops all over the country. I, I never joined a guild. I did for a short time when I lived in Harlem, but because I traveled so much, I couldn't be consistent in my participation in guilds. And so once I moved to LA, I came here for film school is what brought me to LA to go, you know, study film directing. And um, so I took a pause on quilting for three years. I didn't quilt. And then I started back up. And so I really hope to, I want to go to some conferences like that is my goal this year. Now that we're opening back up to really immerse myself in that whole, like the whole quilting culture and the traveling, I see it online and I've always followed the conferences online and the pictures and Instagram, but I want to be in it. Yes. So. Did you join a guild? Not yet. I have not joined a guild and I, I really want to, and I don't know where to start. If you want to join the, the modern guild, just go to their website and they'll give a list of what guilds are in your area. But I think the LA guild was one of the, the first ones. Yeah, I think I'm going to look into that now that we're coming back. Um, I've been participating in like an online guild, but it's just, you know, I want to, I, I want to like be more involved in person. So tell us more about your class about working with African fabrics. So um, I have an online class that is in the works. I just have to finish up a few of the last lessons. I've finished the quilt. But it's, it's a class that demystifies some of the um, questions around working with African fabric. Like you mentioned earlier, the prints are big and bold and they're not, the repeats on them are not like your standard cotton designs. The scale is large and sometimes the repeats don't necessarily happen in one yard or they happen like really far away. So it's a little bit scary cutting into them. We take a look at how we learn about the different types of fabrics and where they're from in the course. We look at the different color stays of the um, different types of fabrics and then ways to use them in traditional piecework because some people don't know how to do that because the repeats are so weird. And if you want that like continuity look, it's, it's a little bit weird. So you just got to get a little bit creative with the fussy cutting, or you got to let that go. You have to implement improvisational piecing um, techniques when it comes to that, or you just let the chips, you just go bold and you just cut and piece it together and be pleasantly surprised when it's done. <laughs> and if you don't like that block, okay. So the class is that, and I teach a pattern that I made in that class. So hopefully now I think I've pushed that to the summer 
to be released because I've been invited to be the featured speaker at the Quilt Africa Summit this summer. And so I am going to lead and teach three workshops of working with African fabric, teaching three, three new patterns that I created specifically for the summit. It's not only going to be me, but it's going to be an amazing lineup of quilters and quilt artists doing sessions all around African fabric. So if you've ever been interested or you have fabric and you're not sure how to use it yet, or you do and you know, but you just want to be around other quilters who love making quilts with African fabric, you want to, you definitely want to look into this summit. Who's organizing it? So Miriam, who runs um, quilt, who has a website called Quilt Africa Fabric. So she runs it out of Nigeria. I went last year as a participant and was just blown away, you know, by the work that's happening and what people can do and what you can do with these fabrics. And just to my surprise, she called and invited me to be a presenter this year. So if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? You can just email me directly either through a form on my website, which is kinaquiltstudio.com, or you can just email me at kina at kinaquiltstudio.com. If they wanted to find you on Instagram or Facebook, what is your handle? At Kina Quilts. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a delight. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Kina Tanji Dorsey. I hope that you are ready to start incorporating these amazing fabrics in your quilting. If you are interested in one of her classes or hearing her speak at the Quilt Africa Summit in July, I'll have her contact information in the notes below. I'll also link her social media and her email. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Marie Anne Lecour of the French Chic Academy, and we will be talking about the importance of decluttering and curating our stuff, whether it be in your wardrobe, your stash, or your home. And you don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing and interesting people on this series. Let one inspire you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.